Hello and welcome to our video series on Chapter 2, Aqueous Chemistry. In this chapter we'll be looking at the properties of water as well as how it interacts with other biological molecules. Since all life as we know it occurs in a water environment, the study of water is the most logical place for us to begin our study of biochemistry. First, however, let's do a brief review of orbitals and bonding. Recall that an atomic orbital is just a representation of where we're likely to find that electron in an atom. It's a mathematical function that describes its wave-like behavior and where we're likely to find it. In our illustration here, we have the atomic orbitals of carbon. Notice there's 1s and 3p orbitals. Now when we form a molecule, those atomic orbitals overlap and we form hybrid orbitals. Illustrated at the bottom of your screen are the hybrid orbitals that are needed to form the simple compound methane. There are four CH bonds and so we have four hybrid orbitals. Notice they're all the same, otherwise it would say it would suggest that one CH bond is different from another, but they are all identical. We have four bonds and so our shape is tetrahedral. Let's look at the types of bonds that we see in biological systems. We're going to start with the strongest and move to the weakest. The strongest type of bond we see is a covalent bond. In this case, the two atoms are sharing their outer shell or valence electrons, hence it is a covalent bond. So this means those atomic orbitals are close enough to overlap, that's the proximity feature, and they also have to be properly oriented. In our figure here, we're looking at the formation of a sigma bond in one of three ways. Let me reassure you, we won't be drawing bonds, we won't be recognizing orbitals. I just want to make the point, if you look at the figure on the far right, regardless of the orbitals that come together, they have to get close enough to overlap and be properly oriented. And that's the point of the illustration here. Our next strongest type of bond is an ionic bond. In this case, the electrons are not shared, but they're actually transferred from one atom to another. A low electronegative atom, this would be the metal ions on the left of our periodic table, give up electrons, and those on the right of our periodic table, the nonmetals, are highly electronegative, and they tend to collect electrons. In this case, we're looking at sodium and chlorine. Recall that we want to achieve that stable octet of electrons. Sodium only has one electron in its outer shell, and so it's easier to give up one than it is to collect seven, so it becomes a sodium plus one ion. Chlorine, on the other hand, has seven outer shell electrons, and so it's easier to accept one than it is to give up seven, and so it becomes a chloride minus one ion. I would point out, however, even though the electron may be said to be transferred, there is some degree of sharing that's going on between the two. In order to better understand what we mean by bonding and the approach of these atomic orbitals, let's do a brief review of the van der Waals radius. This is the distance from the nucleus to the effective electronic surface. In our illustration at the bottom of the slide here, you'll see the van der Waals radius for oxygen and that's indicated by the blue bracket. From the center of the nucleus to the end or outer shell of that electronic surface. When two atoms come close together but there's no overlap, then there is no bond as indicated here. In that case then, the distance between the nuclei are simply the sum of the van der Waals radius. However, when the atoms are too close and their orbitals overlap, then there is a bond that forms between them. In the case of a hydrogen bond distance, illustrated on the bottom of the screen here, that's about 1.8 angstroms. So you can see there's an area of overlap here, but not a large area. So there's a larger distance between the oxygen and the hydrogen. In the case of a covalent bond, however, they come closer together, that is, there's a greater degree of overlap. So the distance between the two nuclei are on the order of about one angstrom. Recall that a shorter distance means a stronger bond. So what we want to look at in our next lesson is, what are some of the characteristics of the hydrogen bonds that we see in water and other molecules? And what other type of bonding and interactions are present in water? How does this contribute to its properties? What we'll see is that water is one of the most unique molecules on planet Earth. 